Welcome to the CLB Forge podcast. This is the show to help equip you and your church for mission, ministry, and multiplying disciples. Here are your hosts, Pastor Mike Natal and Dr. Ryan Nilsson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. Welcome to episode 45. We're really excited about today's conversation. Behind everything we talk about on our show is a really important branch of theology known as missiology. And this is the study of God's mission. Understanding God's mission and engaging in it is central to the vitality, the the ministry, and the purpose of every church. And it's an especially important topic during the COVID pandemic when churches are trying to figure out how to retool ministry and engage in ministry in a meaningful way when the models and methods we're used to don't work anymore. Today's guest is a missiologist. He has a special passion for this subject, and he's making a big impact on our church body's understanding of God's mission. Yeah, allow me to give you a quick bio for Dr. Galen Matheson. He is a graduate of the Hillcrest Lutheran Academy and the Lutheran Brethren Seminary. He holds a PhD from Luther Seminary. He and his wife, Joy, have served the Church of the Lutheran Brethren as church planters, first in Park Rapids, Minnesota, and then in Sendai, Japan for 11 years. He taught the Japanese language and later missiology at the University of Northwestern St. Paul in Minnesota for nine years prior to accepting a call to the Lutheran Brethren Seminary as the professor of mission and evangelism. He has also taught a course as an adjunct professor at Trinity Bible College in uh, Kirch. Oh, now I totally forgot how to pronounce that. Kursk. We're going to have to go back and do that. Kursk, right? Right. Like I literally looked at the word and I was like, oh, that's not how you pronounce that. All right. So anyway, here we go. I don't think you've Um, played enough risk. Kursk. (laughs) Oh, dude. So my sole objective for risk is just to make sure that Troy loses first. I'm not even joking you. That's (laughs) been my soul. All right. Let's get back into this. Dr. Matheson taught the Japanese language and later missiology at the University of Northwestern St. Paul in uh, Minnesota for nine years prior to accepting a call to the Lutheran Brethren Seminary as professor of mission and evangelism. He taught a course as the adjunct professor at Trinity Bible College in Kursk, Russia, and at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. His dissertation was republished as a book uh, called A Theology of Mission, Challenges and Opportunities in Northeast Asia. Galen and his wife, Joy, have three children and seven grandchildren. They are active members at Stavanger Lutheran Church, a rural congregation in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, that serves that is served by the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. Please welcome the Nato connoisseur, Dr. Galen Matheson. Great to have you, Dr. M. Great to be here and great to be talking about uh, my favorite topic. I've been looking forward to this a lot. As we get started here, uh, Galen, we we like to ask our guests uh, to tell a story about one of their discipleship experiences. And we would love to hear from you before we dive into that topic of missiology. Can you tell us about a person in your life that had a big impact on your discipleship journey? Yeah, a a person who immediately comes to mind when I think about that, uh, when I was in college and dating the woman who is now my wife, Joy, Um, Kurt Atneson, Pastor Kurt Atneson was a student at Lutheran Brethren Seminary. He came in the early 70s, and he was very instrumental in the revitalization of Stavanger Lutheran Church. And I became acquainted with him, and uh, Joy and I started attending Stavanger. And Kurt and his wife, Kathy, just took us under their wings and mentored us as a couple. Uh, Kurt performed our wedding. And uh, Kurt and Kathy stayed in touch with us all through seminary and into our ministry, uh, even in the time that we were in Japan. So uh, as, as a couple, they were very important in, uh, in mentoring us spiritually and vocationally as well. And one of the things I really enjoyed about Kurt was his passion for the gospel. And uh, he had a very fun and winsome way about letting everybody he came in contact with know that Jesus loves them. Uh, I've I've heard people say to Kurt, well, Kurt, what do you know? And he'd say, Jesus loves you, and so do I. And uh, he had just such a winsome way about him, and and introducing people to Jesus was his number one passion. And so he's he's been a continual inspiration to me all through my ministry and in our marriage. So it wasn't just uh, a one-on-one mentoring either. I mean, it sounds like 
Kurt and Kathy as a couple were as a huge a blessing to you and Joy. Yeah. Yes. And that's a model that Joy and I have used in our ministry as well. Uh, whenever oh. possible, you know, the two of us working with people, um, you know, what I miss, she gets and vice versa. So uh, it works out quite well to be a couple on mission. Yeah, that's tremendous to uh, to think about and the impact that one couple can have on so many future couples. You know, think about how uh, that discipleship has really birthed into uh, other opportunities, not only that you've passed down to your kids, but also uh, to those who are in the seminary. I know while my wife and I went through seminary, you guys had a huge impact on on our lives and the way that you reached out to us and and really showed that you cared. And uh, those are the things that that people remember. Uh, And hopefully that's one of the things that kind of rubs off on them. And then they take that to the next person that they uh, interact with as well. One of the things that I would love to talk about is that word mission, because it seems to have multiple definitions and maybe the way that people understand it is slightly different. And so um, if you could explain to us, uh, what does the word mission mean? It, it is defined a lot of different ways. And, and this is where I think it's helpful for us to have this kind of a discussion so that, that we can be on the same page and, and know how we're using these terms. When I think about defining the word mission, uh, I think we can approach it a couple of ways, and it's, it's good to approach it from more than one uh, vantage point. Uh, one is to think about it semantically. What does the word mean? And, and thinking of it from a, a linguistic standpoint, uh, the word mission comes from the Latin word missio, and uh, it, it gained in prominence in the 16th century in the church when the church was talking about God as ascending God. When uh, God the Father sent the Son, when the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and over time it came also then to mean when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are sending the church, because missio means to send. Uh, But it's more than that, and and this is where I think we, we need to come at it from another vantage point, and that is theologically. When we're talking about mission, we're talking about the saving activity of God. Mission is on his heart, and redeeming his lost creation is his passion. And so whatever God does to bring that about, that is mission in that sense of the word. And, uh, and, and so we are involved then in God's mission. It is rooted, grounded, and sourced in him, not the church, not the world. It's rooted, grounded, and sourced in God. It's his mission. And, and I think that takes a lot of pressure off of us as well, because uh, the church being created in the image of a missionary God, it is then natural for us to be in mission. And when we were talking a moment ago about, you know, the discipling activity of, of Kurt and Kathy in, in my life and in Joy's life, in our life as a couple, uh, it wasn't something that they were overthinking. It wasn't overly programmatic. It was very organic. It was very natural. It just flowed out of the relationship. And so I I think when we think of mission in this way, that this is something that God is up to. And he calls us to participate in that. He calls in us to join him in that. Uh, It isn't up to us. It isn't a task laid on the church. And okay, you know, we got to get off our duffs and we got to accomplish this. We got to get this done. Uh, it, it takes that kind of pressure off because we realize God is in the foreground of this. He is making the advance. The gospel is advancing. And as we're swept up in this mission of God, uh, then we're simply doing what it's our very nature to do. And, and that's why I like to talk about the mission of God being at the core of the church's identity. It shapes our identity and it gives us a perspective in thinking about what it means to be God's missionary people and what it means to be his church in mission with him. So in a nutshell, uh, that's a number of weeks condensed down into 60 seconds. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for uh, that definition too, because I think as people hear the word mission, they associate with so many different things. Um, And sometimes they lose focus on the mission that's right here in their backyard 
even right next door with their neighbor or even in their very own household. All of that can be um, an opportunity for mission. And I think that people might get um, maybe not lost or confused, but maybe bogged down by the idea of when they hear mission, sometimes they instinctively think about missionaries. And so could you spend a little bit of time um, maybe explaining what the difference is between mission versus missions? with an S at the end of it, if I didn't enunciate that better, mission versus missions. Yes, and I think that's a good way to distinguish the two. When we think about mission, uh, one of my students said it was helpful to him to think of mission with a capital M, because that's God's mission. And when we think about missions with the S at the end, what we're, what we're doing there is talking about the activities of the church as we are called into mission with a capital M. And so whatever we do in participation with what God is doing, those activities that that we carry out as the church, uh, that's what we think of in terms of missions with an S. And um, I, I think it's also helpful to clarify mission and missions are, are pretty broad in their meaning and in what they encompass. Uh, Just as the gospel is a holistic gospel that touches all of life, uh, so in the same way, mission and missions encompass all of life. And at the core of that, a very essential and critical part of missions is evangelism. And I think sometimes people get confused here because they they see evangelism and missions as synonymous, and Mm -hmm. they're really not. Missions is the larger category And evangelism is a very critical part of that. So whatever we do in terms of mission activity or missions, uh, we do so with a view that eventually we want to get to the evangelistic part of that. And we want to see evangelism happen because uh, calling people into a transforming experience of the, with the gospel and with Jesus Christ, the conversion experience is something that we always have a view toward. And so anything then that that moves us in that direction and supports that work of evangelism is, in in our broader understanding, missions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for uh, specifying that uh, for us, because I know that that can be something that people uh, might not fully understand. And even now, you know, it, it takes time to actually look into it and to start speaking more intentionally towards those things. And so it's definitely a a work in progress. I remember when, you know, I first started taking those seminary classes with you, it really was eye-opening because I had never thought of mission being different than missionary being different than missions, when in fact, each one has a different nuance, but they all work together for the greater purpose of furthering you know, the kingdom of God, which is great. Um, I heard you mention there was a Latin word in there that you mentioned, which was missio. Um, Could you spend a little bit of time explaining to us what the term uh, missio dei means? Uh, Yes, this this is a a term that is, again, we can trace it back to the 16th century, but it came into prominence in missiological discussion in the 20th century and especially around the 1950s, and it arises out of the International Missionary Council. Uh, That that council no longer exists, but um, that that group actually got this term going. And and the reason that the term Missio Dei came into usage was because people were used to thinking in terms of mission or missions as, again, a task laid on the church and something that the church had to accomplish. And so then mission became something and missions became something in their thinking that was very church-centered, very anthropocentric, human-centered. It was something that we were supposed to do. And and so people started to see that, wow, you know, when you think of it that way, uh, missions can very easily fall into sort of like expanding empire kinds of things. So the West began thinking of itself as as a Christian West and thinking of the rest of the world as pagan and needing to be reached. But in the process of missionaries going out, they found themselves going out along with imperial powers and and exporting Western culture became 
part of uh, bringing the gospel to people. And, and those things became integrated and confused. So people started to realize, you know, this is getting to be a very anthropocentric, a very human-centered enterprise here. It's looking a lot like expansion of empire, and that's really not what we see in Scripture, is it? Mm -hmm. So they started thinking about how can we talk about the mission of God as something distinct from culture, something that is supracultural, over culture, and above culture, and, and how, can we, how can we see this as something that needs to be happening in the West as it is happening elsewhere as well? And so they started talking about the continual conversion of the church. And the continual conversion of the church is happening as the church is taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they said, we need to root, ground, and source this in the missionary God himself, not in the church. And then the mission of God is something that we are called into, and, and we follow him. And so Jesus then becomes the model of how to do mission. And um, unfortunately, there has become sort of an opposition between, okay, do we look to Jesus as a model of mission, or do we look to Paul? And the answer to that is yes, <laughs> because Paul is following Jesus, and Paul is taking what Jesus modeled and, and he's utilizing that in his own call into God's mission and his ministry. And so we need to get into the scriptures. And, and these, these people that were creating this word missio Dei as a way of thinking about mission rooted, grounded, and sourced in God, they were emphasizing that we need to go back to the scriptures and we need to dwell in scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. And we need to see the overarching narrative there is a mission narrative. And then as we preach and teach, we call our people in the pews to take their little mini narrative and plug that into the big narrative of this missionary God. And in so doing, we begin then to identify ourselves as God's missionary people. You don't have to cross salt water to be a missionary. You don't even have to change your zip code because mission is happening right in our own communities as it is also happening in Japan, Taiwan, Chad, and, uh, and other places in the world. And, and thinking of it that way, let, let's go back to, to Matthew 28, 18 to 20, when Jesus is giving that commission, what we call the Great Commission. What did he say? Go into all the world, right? Mm -hmm. Not just into the faraway places, but into yep. all the world. Acts 1.8 you will be my witnesses. That's not a suggestion. <laughs> He's speaking prophetically <laughs> there. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea. And then, and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He didn't just say Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, did he? He said mm -hmm. both in Jerusalem and in Judea. So we need to look at God's mission as enveloping the whole world, including North America, and the communities in which our churches are located. And it's exciting to think about this, that every one of our congregations is a congregation of missionary people working in that community locally to proclaim the gospel, as they are also supporting the gospel in faraway places. And let me just underscore here, we don't want to fall into the trap of seeing mission only locally and forgetting about the faraway places. It's not either or, it's both and. So um, that, that's, uh, that's how I think about that. And I, I think it's helpful for us as the church to think of it in those kinds of terms. That uh, the yeah. Missio Dei, we're talking about mission with a big M. It's, it's about God. He does it. And then he calls us to join him in what he's doing. And then those activities are mission with an S, missions. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I really liked how you brought up because I I've heard some uh, different arguments of, you know, how should we do mission? Should it be like Christ? Should it be like Paul? I, I've even heard people point out, you know, should it be like James or like Peter or, you know, one of those? And and I and I love that it, it can be a both and, you know, all of them were inspired by Christ, but each one of their missions looked 
each one of their mission looked totally different. And I think that that's encouraging to us because if they all look the same, then we would just be cookie cuttering it out and trying to say, okay, how do we do this? As opposed to saying like, how does it naturally flow out of you? Like what, what are your passions? What are your desires? What are your hobbies? What do all of those look like? And how does God manifest himself in that way in order to encourage people while you're doing those things. You know, I think yeah. about that one parable where it talks about uh, feeding the homeless and the needy. And their response was, well, like, Lord, when did we see you in need and fed you? When did we see you in need of clothing and clothed you? And I think that that has a lot to do with mission. A lot of times people who are living their life out for the Lord intentionally sometimes don't even know how they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which is great, you know, and they can have an impact on people. And that's why I always try to encourage at least people, uh, in my congregation, I'm like, Hey, if you see somebody doing something that has an impact on you or on people around you, you should stop and tell them because there's a good chance that they might not even realize that they're doing it because mm-hmm. they're just doing it organically and naturally. So thank you for bringing that up. That was, yeah. that was great. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you said that Mike, because what you're getting at there too is mission happens in a context and and every context is going to look a little bit different. The message is the same. It never changes. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and also there's been this debate in missiology where Stephen Neal said, well, if everything is mission, then nothing is mission, but we need to understand the times in which Stephen Neal was writing that he was writing that when, when mission was being thought of in, in a secular sort of way, when the more liberal side of the church was secularizing missions and thinking of it is only in this worldly terms. And so then they were thinking, well, then, you know, if, if we're feeding the poor and if we're working for justice and all these kinds of things, we're doing missions. But they were leaving the transforming gospel and the U-turn of conversion out of it. So that's what Stephen Neal was addressing. So while we might not necessarily say that everything the church does is always mission or missions, uh, we, we can say, however, that everything that the church thinks about, talks about, does, needs to be coming from a missions perspective, from the perspective of God on a mission. So our worship is, is planned out and carried out with a mission perspective. Our fellowship is carried out with a mission perspective. We encourage one another, we equip one another, and our outreach is, of course, done from a missionary perspective, but that's always done within a context. So it doesn't look like it does in some other part of the country or even in some other part of the state or the world. Uh, It's going to look like it needs to look in the context in which it is taking place. And, and that's an important point to think about as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Galen, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about why a fresh understanding of mission is so critical for churches in North America right now. Yeah, I, I think you hinted at it earlier, uh, Ryan, when, when you were talking about um, things don't work today like they used to work. And it's because our culture has changed, our environment, our context, if you please, has changed. We're living in a different kind of world. And uh, and because we're living in a post-Christian society where the church is not at the center of everything and and where um, Dr. Bo talks about it this way, it used to be where people had some understanding of the gospel in their heads. They had some, some Bible stories. They had something there that we could work with. And all you had to do was basically move it 18 inches down to the heart. We don't live in that kind of time anymore. And so simply doing the same thing with more effort is not getting us more effective results and better results. So we have to start thinking like missionaries again. And I I think it's helpful in our local congregations if we begin thinking of our congregation as a church plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're we're planting the church fresh here. When, uh, when Ed Stetzer came to J-Term a while back, he talked about uh, his understanding of who the Lutheran Brethren is and our identity as, as a as synod with a very strong global mission emphasis. And he made the statement, and I'll never forget it, he said, what you've been doing so well overseas, 
you need to start doing that here at home. So as congregations, yeah. we need to think of ourselves as miss missionary outposts. We need to think of ourselves as God's missionary people, because the world is, is not just simply uh, identifying with us any longer. And he also talked about how uh, you have the, the, the strong anti-church atheist, you have the secularized person, and then you have the nominal Christians, and, and you have the church. And it used to be that those two were, were pretty much simpatico with each other. Uh, nominal Christians embraced church values. They thought the church was a good thing to have in their community. But he said what has happened is that group has shifted over to the secular and the atheist groups. And mm -hmm. so now the church is finding itself pretty much on its own. And the only people we're talking to anymore is us. So he said, you need to start thinking about outreach and missions work in your community as though you're reaching secular people and atheistic people. You have to think about how to put that gospel in terms that they can understand. And this gets back to what uh, Mike and I were talking about just a moment ago. Context is everything. Mm -hmm. who, who is the audience that we're trying to reach? We need to exegete our congregations. Who are our people? What are the giftings and the talents and, the, and, and all of that that makes up our congregation? We have to exegete our community. Who are the people out here that we're wanting to reach? And then how do we take this group that has a statement of faith and a, and a certain biblical belief and, and get them together with, with the group outside that we want to reach? How do we bring those things together? And, and that's something the church has always done and always had to do, but we're having to do it in a fresh new way today. And I think thinking about God's mission and the church being swept up into that mission is helpful. And, and secondly, I think we need to, uh, in our preaching and our teaching, we need to talk about involvement in God's mission as a get-to, not a have-to. The law is always a short-term motivator. Hmm. So we need to inspire our people, and the best way to do that is to get us into the biblical story, to get us into dwelling into Scripture, to see how God is a missionary God and how he has always called his people into his mission, and, and, and let, the, let that story, let the gospel inspire them so that it's something that they want to share. Let them think about what they're already doing and think about how can I do that from a missionary perspective. I read a story by one pastor talking about a group of women in his church, and uh, he, was, he was trying to get them to think about uh, missions locally, and they said, well, you know, we've got so much stuff going on here at church. You know, I've got this aerobics group that meets at church, and I've got this going and this going. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, aerobics. Uh, why do you have to do that at church? Why, why can't you do that out at the fitness center or something like that? And she thought, and she said, Boy, you know, yeah, if we did that, we would come into contact with people who are outside the church, and we could get to know them, and we can hang out and have coffee. Yeah, we can do that. So it isn't adding stuff on to what we're already doing, but it's taking what we're already doing and seeing that through a mission lens and dedicating that to mission work. Uh, I shared on this uh, at a church not too long ago. And as I was packing up my stuff and saying goodbye to everybody, uh, one of the guys who was a well-known businessman in the community, highly respected, came up to me and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, you mean I'm a missionary too? Yes, yeah. you're a missionary too. Now, you might not be the kind of missionary that has to learn another language and a culture and separate from your home and go a far distance away. That's a, that's a specialized kind of missionary work. But in the sense that we're all called to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, yes, you're a missionary too. And uh, so encouraging our people to, uh, to think about what we get to do. Uh, we get to be God's missionary people. The writer Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said it this way, and I've, I've used this quote in a number of different settings. He said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. 
Hmm. So, you know, it isn't, well, you got to do this and you got to do this this way and so forth. It's no, let's talk about what God is up to in our world. And based on what we see him doing in scripture, let's look to see what's happening in our communities and see how can we join God in that. And, uh, and, and that's, that's uh, the exciting part of, of being swept up in what God is doing. That's what inspires that we get to be a part of that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for, for putting it that way. I, I'm really struck by something you said earlier that you know, joining God in his mission is part of the conversion of the church. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's so freeing to realize that even as we come to understand God's calling on our lives in a new way, that God is he's sanctifying us and transforming us through that. It's not just about the people we're reaching. No. But it's changing our hearts, our minds. It's changing our lives us as well. too. Yeah. yeah, and so we get to see people moving from being consumers of religious goods and services to being on yeah. people on mission with a missionary God. Yeah, you know, that that's a beautiful paradigm shift, I think. Mm-hmm. I think when I go in to uh, work with churches that are having ch- challenges, one of the one of the common threads that I see is is that that the the church is out of alignment with uh, the healthy understanding of mission. And so it's, mm-hmm. it's viewed as an optional side project or mm-hmm. hobby, a program that, yeah, if they have time or energy or money, they'll, they'll contribute to it. And, mm-hmm. and they may not even associate their surrounding community with it in any way. Um, yeah. So I love, I love the perspective you're putting on this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think uh, that comment, Ryan, uh, lends really well with our, uh, with our next question too. Um, so perfect segue. You did great. I was actually kind of surprised, Ryan, that when uh, Dr. Matheson threw up that Spock sign that, <laughs> that you didn't instinctively do it back to him. Wait, I missed the Spock sign? You, the he was salute? talking... Yeah, he was talking about how, you know, the church and uh, they were together and then they changed. So now the church was kind of out here. And I oh. saw it and I was like, sure oh. enough, Ryan's going to throw up that Spock sign, dude, like as a Star Trek junkie. Did, but you missed it, Ryan. Did we ask you, Galen? What do you think is better, Star Trek or Star Wars? <laughs> no, you didn't. And uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good. Yeah. Yeah, great, great job assimilating yeah. with both Ryan and I. See, you're, you're, I'm you are just exactly <laughs> you. You are just that's smart. Mission through and through, which is good. Well, um, and now I ruined right, your so segue, oh, Mike. I totally ruined no, no, your no, segue. No, that's okay. So, so just go for it. it. And it was a good segue about uh, individuals who maybe are in their church who are looking to be more mission minded, but they're looking around and they're saying, you know, we're struggling a little bit. And so uh, Dr. Matthias, and what advice would you give to like a church leader or even someone who's listening to this today, who just wants their church to be a little bit more mission mindset uh, oriented? What type of advice would you give them as they look out into their community or as they try to encourage their church to do the same? I think it starts with, with us, of course. Um, my, my thinking on this has been in transition for a couple of decades. Uh, it, it takes time. And so I would say, you know, begin with yourself exploring this in, in a sense of reading scripture through a mission lens. Uh, you know, the, God's mission is a hermeneutic. Uh, along with law and gospel and a number of other hermeneutics. There is no one correct hermeneutic. There there are various lenses that we bring to Scripture as we read it and study it and learn it. So begin yourself to read Scripture through a mission lens and see what God is up to in Scripture and what he wants to do. And and start incorporating incorporating that into your own life as, as you relate out into the community. Uh, For example, for myself, my wife and I are involved in a local food shelf. We volunteer there uh, through Stavanger Lutheran Church. Uh, I'm part of uh, a local chapter of the North Country Scenic Trails, National Scenic Trails. So um, I'm working with a group of people there. Uh, what What are ways that we can get into the community and rub shoulders with with the people in our community outside of our church? 
and uh, and then you know start pouring your life into a group of people around you, and helping them to start seeing themselves, their gifts, their talents, their interests, their hobbies, their families, through the perspective of missions. And as my life then starts impacting the lives of those around me, we become people on mission. And and as people start seeing results coming out of that, they get inspired and want to be a part of it. So in your preaching and your teaching, again, the big meta narrative of God on a mission, encouraging people to plug their little mini narrative into that, and then modeling it. I think modeling is a very effective way of teaching. So, so they can see how much fun we're having, and, and they can see people uh, who are being changed by their association with these missional groups that are active out in the community. And make sure that everybody in the church feels a part of this. You know, th- this can't be one little missional click over here who's doing their thing, and people over here fe- feeling left out and having no part in it. It needs to be... Um, the story of the whole congregation, and whatever it is that people can contribute, they need to see that that's valuable in the mission of God, contributing to us being a missional congregation, an evangelizing church, a disciple-making church. Uh, I I got together with a group of people a few years back, and uh, and we wanted to to be more involved in the community. And and one of the things that we decided to do, um, someone in the group said, hey, you know, there's, there's a, a little league uh, program here in Fergus, and there's a group of young kids who don't have any sponsor, don't have any coach, but they want to play ball. Why don't we adopt them? And, and we can be a group that, that sponsors this little league, and, and we can coach them and encourage them. And uh, those of you who know me know I'm not much of an athlete. So I'm, I'm sorry, okay, okay, how am I going to fit into this? <clears throat> you know, I can't teach these kids how to bat. I don't know how to bat. <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, we talked about it and said, well, hey. Hey, I can you, identify with that. Yeah, yeah. You, you can identify the sports ball, right, Ryan? Mm-hmm, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we, can, we can get to know the parents. You know, we can go to the games. We can cheer on the kids. And, and we decided that uh, we're going to do a batting workshop for these kids, and we're going to do a barbecue for the parents. So, uh, you know, a couple of the guys are out on the ball field in the park working with the kids. The rest of us are over here with the picnic tables and we got the barbecue going and and we're relating to the parents. And I I couldn't believe how this came together. Uh, These parents came up to us and just started opening up, sharing their lives about their work, their families, their Mm -hmm. marriage. And we're just watching this happen. And, you know, we're, we're sharing with them and sharing from our own perspective and, you know, bringing the gospel into the conversation. Well, out of that came parents who decided, you know, uh, these people who are connected with the church, they've got something I need and something I'm looking for. I need that. And the next thing we knew, they were in membership classes and becoming members of the local congregation. Nice. And And it was just a very natural thing. You know, it wasn't a program. It was just, Here's a group of people who have a need, and we can come alongside and meet that need in a very personal and caring way. And and I heard after that that um, someone went out to the local fire hall and and was talking to someone about this Little League group and and this group of people who adopted their families and their kids. And they said, you know what? You know, these people are not just about softball. They care about us. Mm. So they sense that, that we were doing that, not just because we love softball and think it's cool, but we care about people and that's why we're doing it. And, and so we were taking time out of our lives to serve them. And I, I think service is a key word here. How can we serve this community in a way that says XYZ Church cares about this community? Uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's a, a very easy and natural way to get into this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Galen. That's great counsel. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for sharing with, with us today. Thanks for being our guest. You My can, pleasure. Uh, listeners, you, thank you for being with us today. Uh, you can find out more about Lutheran Brethren Seminary and see more of what Dr. Matthiasen is doing by visiting lbs.edu. Also, if you're looking for someone to follow on Facebook that's actually 
an uplifting, positive impact on your life, Galen, <laughs> highly recommend you find him. Thank you all for yes. listening to our show today. Don't forget to subscribe to our show, and we'd love it if you share the podcast with a friend or colleague. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. See ya. See ya. This has been an episode of the CLB Forge podcast with Pastor Mike Natal and Dr. Ryan Nilsson. Thanks for listening. We welcome your questions and comments. Email us at podcast at clbforge.org.